We're going to be in Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11 this morning. The story of the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15, verse 11, beginning in verse 11. Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So what does prodigal mean? It basically means wasteful, particularly with regard to money. Anybody in here ever wasted any money on prodigal living? Now if I had all the money I had wasted on chasing after women, <laughs> drinking alcohol, doing drugs, you know what, I could be retired like Carrie. We could be playing golf every day. So it basically means wasteful. It comes from the Latin root that means forth or pro and to drive a gear. It indicates the quality of a person who drives forth his money, who wastes it by spending with reckless abandon. So why does Jesus tell this parable? This question is answered at the beginning of Luke chapter 15. Notice this. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him to hear him and the Pharisees and the scribes murmured saying this man receives sinners and eats with them so he told them his parable so now who was accusing him Pharisee. the Pharisees and the scribes were murmuring this man receives sinners and eats with them and Jesus said he came to seek and save that which was lost. Now we're all sinners, right? So he came to seek and save us, right? Amen. So what do we do? We do what Jesus did. Jesus ate with the sinners and the tax collectors. That's what we do. So if God, call, if God is calling the prodigals to come home and they happen to be sinners like us, what do we do? We eat with them. We socialize with them, right? That's what we do as Christians. We don't point the finger at them and say, well, you don't look like an Adventist. You don't dress like an Adventist. You don't eat like an Adventist. Therefore, you're not an Adventist. Is that what Jesus did? Jesus didn't do that. He ate with the ones he wanted to save. He socialized with them. That's what we should be doing. We're not an exclusive club here. So Jesus tells three parables. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost son, which is the parable of the prodigal son. All three parables are on the subject of recovering the lost, which is why Jesus receives sinners and eats with them. They are lost and he wants to recover them. Now something interesting about this parable. You know, the first two parables, the lost sheep and the lost coin, he went after them looking for them. But in this parable, he did not. He waited for them to come home. So this story represents people who know the way home to the Father. They have left the church or left the faith. They've given up on God. But one day, they may decide to come back. And we have to be ready to receive them. So what's happening in this parable? Let's look at We've already read 11 through 13. So Jesus' parables are based on real life situations. Though they often veer off from the expected course of events in surprising ways, those surprises teach us lessons. Here Jesus relates the situation of a father who has two sons, one of whom can't wait for his inheritance. In Jewish society, there were laws regarding how inheritances were typically divided. The oldest brother got a double share. Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse 17. While the other brother got a single share. 
When there were two brothers as here, the older brother would get two-thirds of the estate and the younger brother would get one-third. So this prodigal son was asking for one-third of his father's estate. In the parable, the younger son demands the share of property that falls to me in verse 12. Give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. That means he is asking for one third of the father's possessions that he would ordinarily get when the father dies. He's asking his father to give him one third of everything that he owns right now before the father is dead when his father would still have use of those possessions. Now how many fathers would receive that suggestion well today? How many would comply if one of their children asked it? Would you? What if one of your children come to you and demanded, I want one third of your wealth? What would you say? That's why it's a parable. Because <laughs> nobody's going to do it, right? So you'd say, boy, I brought you into this world and I can take you out, right? So this was an unusual request. You know, I thought about if I went to my father right now and said, Father, I know you're not dead. But I want one third of your wealth. What do you think about that? I don't think he'd be, he'd be angry. He'd say, boy, get out of my house. But you know, he would probably be hurt. And I'm not even dead yet. And the boy wants his inheritance. So this is truly an astonishing request. And it would have been even more astonishing in the ancient world. In a society that highly reverenced parents, it would have been equivalent to saying, Father, I can't even wait for you to die. Give me one third of everything that you have right now. Astonishing. What does the Father's reaction teach us? Despite the breathtaking and insulting audacity of the younger son's request, he, the Father grants it. Isn't that amazing? He gave it to him. Now you know, young men, and I was one of them, you believe when you're young, you can go out and conquer the world, right? I'm invincible. Nothing bad is going to happen. Just give me the money. Isn't that what we think? It don't always work out that way, though, does it? This reflects the amazing indulgence that the God shows toward us. And this parable is about God, our Heavenly Father. Even when we are acting as selfishly as the prodigal son, God indulges us. He yields what is His and allows us to misuse it out of respect for the freedom that He has given us. He does. But our Heavenly Father knows that the misuse of our freedom will have no better results than it did with the prodigal son's misuse of his freedom. God trusts that we will learn our lesson and come back to Him. So what does the prodigal son do next? Let's pick up the story in 14. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, that he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled the stomach his stomach with the pods that the swines ate and no one gave him anything. So after he gets one third of his father's estate, he takes everything he has and goes into a far country and there he squandered his property in loose living. In context, this means that he abandoned the Holy Land to go voluntarily into exile into a Gentile pagan country where he could live loosely without being censored by fellow Jews living all around him. He just wanted to get away. He wanted to be unknown so he could live any way he wanted. You know, some people just hide out. They hide from other people. Hide from their neighbors. They hide from God. They just want to live the way they want to live. So he wanted to, he wanted to get out of God's land so that he could live in sin and fund his sinful lifestyle by what he took from his father. So he wanted to move to Vegas. <laughs> Can you imagine just taking all your wealth, even what your father gives you, and going to Vegas? Now, he wasn't going for a week trip. He went there. He moved there. 
You know what happens in Vegas? You got prostitutes. You got gambling. You got drugs. You got alcohol. Everything you can imagine is in Vegas. This is where this, this, is where this young man was living. In Vegas. That's what my daughter did with her grandfather in there. She went really? to Vegas. Yeah. She wasted it? Yeah. Vegas. Well, if you want to waste money, you can certainly do it in Vegas. If he had not spent what he had on loose living with prostitutes, he would have had the money he needed to weather the hard time, but he didn't. Brothers and sisters, we need to put a little money aside for a hard time. You know, it's amazing to me how many people just live from paycheck to paycheck, never put a penny aside. They waste it. They spend it fast as they get it. Now, Samuel probably can attest to this. On a construction site, if you pay the men on Thursday, you ain't going to see them on Friday. They're going to show up on Monday when they're broke, when everything is gone. Right, Samuel? So in other words, Vegas sure loves loose levers. He does. That's right. Thus he was reduced to a state of hunger and had to subject himself to a pagan humiliation. Number one, to feed the pagans' pigs. Number two. So he was subject to a pagan. Feeding pigs. This was to the most humiliating job for a Jew. Is to feed swine. He would have been happy just to eat as well as the pigs. Humiliation number three. The best food available was what the pigs was eating. But nobody gave him anything to eat. Not even from the pig's slop. Humiliation number four. Having been brought to such a low state, he recalled how his righteous father treated even his hired servants better. How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, but I perish here with hunger? Let's read verse 17 through 19. It says, But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he thus plans to return to his father and say three things. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Now you think about this. When we have truly messed up and we know it, we come up with a plan. This is what I'm going to say. This is what i got to do. i got to come up with a plan. And I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in dire straits here. i got no food. I'm living with these pigs. And here my father's got all this wealth. Even, in, even his servants have more than me. But he knows he's messed up. He knows he's squandered all this wealth. And you know what he thinks the father's going to say? Boy, I gave you your inheritance. I'm not giving you anymore. I'm done with you. Isn't that what we believe? So he wasn't expecting any grace, no mercy. Even being treated as one of the Father's hired servants would be better than the treatment he is receiving in the Gentile world. Now think about that, brothers and sisters. Don't we get treated better in our Father's house than we do out in the world? Yeah. Don't we? Why do we spend so much time out in the world where they beat us up? They reduce us to nothing. They steal our wealth. Make us live with the pigs. When we can come into our Father's house and live blessed, why don't we do it? So what do the actions of the prodigal son teach us? They teach us the depths to which our own misuse of freedom will bring us. If we are bent on, le on leaving God, things will go badly for us. We will be humiliated in the uncaring world. The farther we get, the farther we get from the Father's loving care, the worse off we will be. And our best course is to return to God and His forgiveness. So, what does the Father do next? Let's pick it up the story here. This is our scripture reading. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. 
and no, am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this, was, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. So when the prodigal son returns to his father, something significant happens. While he is still at a distance, the father sees him, has compassion upon him, runs to him, hugs him, kisses him. The father was watching for his son to return. I want to tell you something this morning, brothers and sisters. God is watching for his prodigals, Amen. waiting for them to return. And when they return... What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to throw a party. Amen. While he is still at a distance, the Father sees him, has compassion upon him, runs to him, hugs him, kisses him. This is far from the humiliating reunion that the son might expect based on his previous audacious and insulting treatment of his father. The returning son must have been astonished, but he continues by beginning to recite his prescriptive speech to his father, and he manages to get the first two parts out of it. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But before he can say the third part, before he can ask to be treated merely as a servant, the father interrupts things, takes them in a very different direction. Rather than treating his younger son as a mere servant, he turns to the actual servants and orders a celebration. Can you imagine? The father turns to his servants and says, Throw a party. Can you imagine? Everyone erupted in joy. The servants are running around. Kill the fatted calf. The son was dead, but now he's alive. You know what we're supposed to do in the church when the prodigal comes home? The father didn't say, son, when you go take a shower or a bath, clean yourself up, when you get some new clothes on, I'm going to put you out in the field, and when you've paid every last cent, then you can be my son again. God does not do that. Neither should we. We don't treat the prodigals that way. We treat them like the father did. We love them right back into the church, right? So they throw the party. The son has come back. What do the actions of the father teach us? The first lesson is that the father will not treat a son as a hired servant. We are sons of God. The younger son is still a son. Even though we go out into the world, we make mistakes. We get pregnant at 17. We're still... A child of God. Amen. As a result, his return is something to be celebrated. He is to wear a fancy robe. Can you imagine the father putting this fancy robe on this stinking man that smells like pig? That's true love. So when people come into the church and they smell like the streets, what are we supposed to do? Welcome. Put a robe on them. Celebrate. We don't tell them to go get cleaned up. Go and, go and take a bath and get some good clothes on. And then you can come be a part of our church. No, brothers and sisters, that's not what we do. They put a fancy ring on him. You know something? When we put rings on ourselves to adorn us, it's wrong. But when God puts a ring on our finger, we're to celebrate. Shoes. There is to be a fancy feast for everyone. There is to be music and dancing. Don't sound like an advent of celebration, does it? They're dancing. They're celebrating. There is something called a holy dance, brothers and sisters. You, don't, you know when one of the prodigals come home, all of heaven is rejoicing. They're throwing a party. But sometimes here in the church, we have somber faces. Like, why is this person getting treated so well? They've been out here in the world living like the devil. Why? Because this, my son, was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. This shows us God's reaction when we return from being lost in sin. 
He doesn't begrudge us with what we have done. He doesn't take us back reluctantly. Like the Father in the parable, He takes us back joyously, eagerly. And brothers and sisters, we need to rightly represent our Heavenly Father. Amen. When people come out, the prodigals come home, we treat them like the Father would. We celebrate. We're joyous. We're eager for them to come. Now what does the older brother do next? Let's look at the older brother. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But notice 28, But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you, I have never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. So this elder brother had not been sharing in his father's anxiety and watching for his brother that was lost. You know what the older son represents in this parable is us that's been in the church. Those ones that's grown up in the church. Those ones that's been in the church for a long time. And when someone new comes in that gets a lot of attention, oh no, this ain't right. I've been in this church my whole life. I'm the one that should be getting the attention. He shares not, therefore, in his father's joy at the prodigal's return. The sounds of rejoicing excite jealousy in his heart towards his lost sibling. You know, I came in the church, I experienced this firsthand. Most people were happy to see me, but there was one person in particular that did not care for me. Didn't like the attention I was getting. Not one penny of the money he wasted belonged to the older brother. How much of it did he waste of his, of his inheritance? None of it. You know what this means? This was between the father and his son, and his older brother had nothing to do with it. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, it's not always about us. It's about the father and his lost children. We don't need to make it about us all the time. It's not always about us. He plainly shows that he had been in the father's place. He would not have received the prodigal. He does not even acknowledge him as a brother, but coldly speaks of him as thy son. Never even called him his brother. The older brother sees this difference in treatment as a manifest injustice toward him, and he is angry with his father because of it. So he's not so much angry with his brother, he's angry with the father. What does the father do? In verse 31 and 32. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. For the father tells the son three things. First he tells him, Son, you are always with me. Through all these years of your brother's outcast life, have you not had the privilege of companionship with me? Second he tells him, All that is mine is yours. The younger son took his third, so the two-thirds that remain will go entirely to the older son. Thus the Father thirdly tells him, It was fitting to make merry and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So what are the spiritual lessons for us? We can be a genuine son of the Father who is spiritually alive and be lost through sin. We can turn our backs on our Heavenly Father and leave Him of our own free will. Mortal sin is a real possibility for all of us.
You know, we look at the prodigals outside of our church and we think, you know, I can never be like them. But you know, we're only one mistake away from being just like them out in the world. Amen. So don't think it can't ever happen to us, brothers and sisters. We should have compassion and mercy for them. Not judging and pointing fingers. We can turn our backs on our Heavenly Father and leave Him of our own free will. That happens quite often. We can, however, return to the Father and be accepted by Him with great joy. In fact, He is ready and eager to accept us back and forgive us no matter what we've done. Christians who have never left the church should not resent those who come back. They should share in the Father's joy. If you've been in the church your whole life, praise God that you never left. But some people did leave. And you know, they may want to come back. And the question is, what are we going to do with them? How are we going to treat them? Your own place is secure and your heavenly reward is not threatened. God loves you just as much as He loves those who come back through a dramatic conversion. I want to finish with this story, and this is, this story here just cracked me up. So if I start to choke up, uh, I might need to just take a second. Have y'all ever read a book uh, by Philip Yancey called "What's So Amazing About Grace"? I have. It's an awesome book. But Yancey tells the story of a prodigal daughter who grows up in Traverse City, Michigan, disgusted with her old-fashioned parents who overreact to her nose ring. The music she listens to, the length of her skirts, she runs away. She ends up in Detroit where she meets a man who drives the biggest car she's ever seen. The man with the big car, she calls him the boss, recognizes that since she's underage, men would pay a premium for her. So she goes to work for him. Things are good for a while. Life is good. But she gets sick for a few days and it amazes her how quickly the boss turns mean. Before she knows it, she's out on the street without a penny to her name. She still turns a couple of tricks at night, and all the money goes to support her drug habit. One night while sleeping on the metal grates of the city, she began to feel less like a woman of the world and more like a little girl. She began to whimper, God, why did I leave? My dog back home eats better than I do now. She knows that more than anything in the world, she wants to go home. Three straight calls home get three straight connections with the answer machine. And finally she leaves a message. Mom and Dad, it's me. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way and I'll get there about midnight tomorrow. If you're not there, I'll understand. During the seven hour bus ride, she's preparing a speech for her father. And when the bus comes to a stop in Traverse City Station, the driver announces the 15 minute stop, 15 minutes to decide her life. She walks into the terminal not knowing what to expect. But not one of the thousand scenes that have played out in her mind prepares her for what she sees. There in the bus terminal in Traverse City, Michigan, stands a group of 40 brothers and sisters. Great aunts and uncles, cousins, and a grandmother and a great grandmother to boot. They're all wearing goofy party hats and blowing nose makers and taped across the entire wall of the terminal is a computer generated banner that reads, Welcome Home. Out of the crowd of well wishers breaks her dad. She stares out through the tears quivering in her eyes and begins her memorized speech. He interrupts her, Hush child. We've got no time for that. No time for apologies. We'll be late. A big party is waiting for you at home. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the message. We know that you want your children to come home. We know there's prodigals right here in our neighborhood, right here in Irmo, right here in the neighborhood we live. And Heavenly Father, help us to rejoice when they come home. We know it's not your will that any should perish, not once. I think Heavenly Father about my family and one of them, just one of them being lost. It's too much, too many. So help us, Lord, to treat the prodigals the way you do. Help us, Lord, to invite them in, to throw a celebration, to rejoice with heaven, to rejoice with them. And we know that one day we'll all be rejoicing in heaven. We know those people that have come back home into our church and are in heaven because we loved and accepted them. It will be our true joy. It will be our true treasure in heaven. And even so, Lord Jesus, come soon. In your holy name I do pray. Amen.